Y'all ready? Good evening. I'm Dr. Jackson. Dr. Shikini Harris Jackson with the city of Apopka. Um, I am the overseer of the Apopka Youth Council and also the grant administrator here for this city. Thank you all for coming today. Um, we are live streaming this um, town hall tonight, so you all will be able to go back and, and view, and hopefully we also have an audience online right now. I would like to, at this time, introduce our panel. We have Courtney Crawford, Dee Dee Eshelman, Pastor Joelle Polk, and Dr. Janice Modest with us today. Thank you all for being here. We also have our AOIC member, Ms. Olivia Young, who will be helping to moderate our conversation tonight. So thank you so much. Um, we started this whole idea of the mental health town hall um, because we submitted a video to the Florida League of Cities back in 2021, and they posed the question, what is the most critical issue that's affecting youth today? And there was an overwhelming response with um, the kids coming back and saying that mental health was the main thing that was affecting them. So we uh, hired a vi videographer and um, actually created this video that I would like to share with you all. Before that, I want to give a special shout out to Annie Joy and Juniper Hope for being here with us today, the therapy dogs. And we're going to play the video that started the whole conversation. Everybody should be able to share their mental health stories with open-mindedness and understanding. But sadly, we live in a society that doesn't allow that to happen. Um, when I was 12 years old, I was diagnosed with a mild form of Tourette's. And most people don't notice my Tourette's because I've dealt with it for a long time, so I know how to suppress it. Whenever I look at my own personal story, I bring it up to some people and they're quite ignorant to the idea. And it makes me want to bring it up less and less. Going to new places and meeting new people is, more, is always more exhausting than it should be. Um, I think it's just because of the stress and anxiousness that comes before it or maybe it's like the regret and self-doubt that comes after me. I usually think so much about what I'm going to say or how I'm going to move or how I'm going to act in any social situation that it comes out either awkward or unkind to her. But I want to be healthy. Like, I want to look effortless. I hate that I overthink every situation after and during it, and that causes me to just stress out more. student, there's already a lot of pressure and responsibilities that you have as is. And then to add on being an athlete and performing at a high level, especially if you want to go to college for that, um, it can put on even more stress. If you're waking up early in the morning, you have before school practice or even late night practice, like you want to sleep, but you have to finish your homework or study for a test. It goes for everything in life. Like your parents expect you to have your grades. Especially for student athletes, like that's not easy. You have practices at all different hours and then trying to maintain the best grades that you're capable of. And the two schedules conflict a lot and sleep is like a major factor. I feel like a lot of people don't talk about this because it's something very personal. I don't like talking about it because I don't like people thinking that I depend on them emotionally. Like sometimes I just feel like really sad. It like it stops me from doing like the, the smallest things I can do like someday at school or sometimes I feel like I'm not. My trauma isn't as important as someone else's because I don't come from like a nice family. 
I don't know, I feel like that also like stops a lot of people from like speaking up about it. What is something we can do or our peers can do to find a solution? Any mindfulness practice is key to getting out of your head because the whole topic that we're talking about is mental health. So if you can become more aware of what is going on in your mind, that will really help you to overcome any sorts of negative thoughts. Definitely starting within the family will help. I think that will cause the most change because um, you're around your parents a lot. So how your parents are going to be talking about mental health with you or even talking about their own mental health. That will help a lot. I feel like telling people that it's okay to have therapy and not have it looked down upon because it's useful and it helps people. So what do you think that our local government can do as well as the apophysy community to help us? Local government in general can create more affordable therapy so that people are more uh, open to the idea of getting help. I think that the mental health days are a great start, but if you want to have more of an impact, then you need to incorporate it into the way that you run your schools. That's good. Well, before you start it again, I can start it again. Before you start it. Oh, I see. That way I can talk to them before we start the music. So hello, everyone. Hello. I'm Dr. Janice. It's nice to meet every one of you. So I'm a behavior coach, so I'm going to uh, use you guys as um, an example. I know in the video, uh, I saw that someone said about mindfulness. And so sometimes we think it's a big word or mindfulness means um, you know, like it's complex, like it literally means like meditation or what does it mean? So mindfulness just means being aware of where you are um, and how you are feeling at the moment and just taking in consideration the space that you're in. So with that in mind, our first short activity before we begin is I want you to be mindful of where you are right now, but then also mindful of how you're feeling. So some of you, your parents took you came home, pick you up and you're rushing and you might be feeling a little bit anxious or worried or sad. So um, I want you to look at those faces and just think about how you may be feeling at this moment. So to be self-aware, think about how you're feeling. And with that in mind, we're going to get centered, which just means we're going to focus in on the now and we're just going to focus in on our breathing before we jump into the next segment. So let's try this mindfulness activity, and then you're gonna hopefully notice a change from, you know, you just came from school or practice, and just be um, comfortable where we are right now. So uh, we're gonna all sit up, and we're gonna put one hand on our stomach and one on our chest. And so you, you put, you're putting your hands both places. I'll stand up for a minute. Just like this, right under your rib cage. And you wanna feel your stomach um, be, uh, breathing in, you want to feel it. And then when you exhale through your mouth, you want to feel your chest going down. So you want to inhale and feel your stomach going in. You want to exhale, feel your chest breathing out. All right. So we're just going to focus in on our breathing. The music is a little bit loud. <laughs> it's supposed to be soft, maybe softer right now. So we're going to click the screen. When you see the, um, it's going to, the breathing is going to help you. I will do guided um, it's like guided 
mindfulness, I will just guide you through it to breathe in and breathe out. So the affirmation we're going to use is I am loved. That's the affirmation. So we're going to be breathing out stress and breathing in love. Okay. All right. Let's try this. I see you guys are ready. Great. Great uh, team. All right. So once the music starts. Or you can just click on the. Uh, oh, God. My body's ready. Okay. So we're just focusing in on our breath. So when it goes in, I'm going to tell you to breathe in. You're going to breathe in love. You're going to exhale um, stress. All right. So let's go. So breathe in and breathe out. In through your nose, out through your mouth. In through your nose, deeply out through your mouth. Breathe in and breathe out. And do it deeply so you can feel your stomach going in and your chest going out. Breathe in, exhale stress. And you're breathing in, just love. Just exhale. And breathe in. Do three more times. Exhale. All right. Inhale. Push it all out. And breathe in. Push it all out. And the last one, we're going to do a big breath in and out. You did it. That was your mindfulness activity. Hopefully you felt the shift and you're ready to, to learn and to be in the moment. So thank you so much, Dr. Janice. Does everyone feel a little less stressed? I do. I do. At this time, we are going to turn it over to Pastor Joel Polk. We're going to have just a prayer and then we'll start with... Um, this is Crawford. Okay. Father, we thank you for this gathering and this assembly. We thank you for this space and time. We thank you for those that are here and those that have joined us online. Father, help us to listen and learn effectively to take in the wisdom that is given so that it can become guidance for our lives. We give you glory, honor, and praise, and we say amen. 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 So on the video, someone said that, well, actually a lot of people said that they were anxious, stressed out, depressed, and had a lot of things that bothered them. And so you might be wondering what anxiety is or what is depression and why is it a problem for me? Anxiety is really fear. It can be fear of many different things. Uh, some people are afraid of social interaction or social settings. They might be naturally shy or introverted and become very uh, stressed out when having to interact with other people. People their age often are more, can be worse than adults, but there's also fear of um, failure, fear of certain you know, types of animals or certain uh, numbers, those are a little bit less common, but just being afraid can cause you to do things or not do things that you want to be able to do. So if you want to know if you're anxious, you can ask yourself, um, do I avoid situations that might be fearful for me? Do I avoid school? Do I avoid um, going to out with my friends? Um, sometimes you can be irritable, you can be fidgety, um, fidgety in a way like you can't really stop moving your leg or you just, um, you just can't really sit still and, uh, be being unable to sleep because your thoughts kind of chase themselves around in your head. Um, thoughts of, of things that, that make you scared, the future, any, any kind of thing. 
So that kind of describes anxiety. Depression, um, people might wonder, are they depressed? And again, the word depression gets used a lot, um, but sometimes I think people don't really know what they're actually, what it describes. Um, you can be sad, but if you're sad, are you depressed? Um, depression is a little more intense than sadness. Uh, it can have sadness as part of it, but a, lo a lot of times it lasts longer. Uh, you can be sad because, you know, your pet maybe passed away, so you would be sad for a little bit, but you would also be able to overcome it and get back to your usual life. Um, depression, sometimes it's hard to overcome. You might be depressed for a couple of weeks. You might be sleeping all the time, unable to motivate yourself to get out of bed, and not just because you're tired and doing a lot, but just because you don't see the point. You might have negative thoughts in your mind, um, like, um, you know, what's the point? It's not worth it. Uh, you know, things that just make you want to continue sleeping and not go on. And you might not even really want to do things that you normally enjoy. So if that goes on for a week, a couple of weeks, you might want to consider um, talking to someone, getting help, because it can get worse. Here we have a question that was submitted online. So someone asked, do we feel anxious because it is helping us or hurting us? I, um, I think that's an excellent question. Um, my name is Dee Dee. I'm a marriage and family counselor. Um, we feel anxious sometimes um, because it is actually helping us. Um, when we think of performance anxious, you know, performance anxiety, um, a little bit of anxiety uh, usually helps us focus um, because of the chemicals that are produced in our brain um, when anxiety gets triggered um, in our brains, we are usually able to focus um, more clearly, okay? But when it goes on, then anxiety can be hurtful to us, okay? Because when we stay in that high state of alert um, for long periods of time, um, it does cause problems um, for our health. Um, causes heart problems. Um, most of the chronic illnesses in our country, um, they talk about those breathing techniques that Dr. Janice just led you in. The, when you have um, heart disease and other chronic illnesses, um, just those mindfulness activities help decrease the stress-related illnesses. And so that's where anxiety or stress can hurt us. Now, stress, of course, can be good stress, and it can be negative stress. Um, the good stress are things like, you know, I've, I've got a new baby on the way, and I'm excited about it. Or um, I'm getting married, and I'm excited about that. Or I just got accepted to the college that, you know, my first choice college that I applied to. Those are things that people consider to be positive in their lives, but they're also stressful. And so accumulative stress and cumulative anxiety is what is, can be harmful. So good question. Thank you. Do the clicker. <laughs> Here's another question for the panel. What should I do if I feel sad, upset, or anxious? Did you want to answer oh, that? yes. I, I actually have some of them on the slide later on. But um, one of the things, one of the other mindfulness activities I can share with you is affirmation. So affirmation is just saying something positive instead of if you normally say, you know, I hate math or I can't believe I have to go to school today. Um, affirmation will be finding a positive thing to say. So for example, if you think you don't hate math, if you think you don't like math, I'm using that because I really don't. Um, <laughs> if you don't like math, you can, you can say something positive like, I am smart or I can handle this or I am successful. So you can just find one for the day and just have it locked and loaded if you know you're gonna need it throughout the day for different things. It can be a, a, a scripture like I am fearfully, wonderfully made. It can be something as simple as we did earlier, like I am loved. 
Um, if you feel like you're going into a situation where um, you're being bullied or people aren't treating you nicely, you can remind yourself that I am loved. And so that's a great way to deal with uh, being anxious because you get to um, before you even get into sadness. So sometimes you can catch it when I like to say in the yellow when you're anxious because we know red is like out of control, those color wheels. Um, so just having things ready like um, breathing right before a test to kind of clear your brain and um, use an affirmation. So I'll leave you with that one for now. We have more later, but you can try affirmations and um, it worked for you today. So it might work for you tomorrow. Thank you. Those are some great tips. I hear that a lot around school. I hate math. So I think a lot of teens <laughs> can use that. Okay, another question. How do I get out of being in a bad mental state? That's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> I think um, one of the things that I think of when um, you know I'm in this place that I can't seem to shake, or when a student is in a place where they can't seem to shake it, um, I usually try to identify first using mindfulness. Um, I identify first how intense is that mental state? You know, Dr. Modest was talking a little bit, how intense is the sadness or the depression, if it's going into that or the anxiety. Um, if it's high, I usually use a scale of zero to 10. And so if it's high, if it's up seven, eight, nine, or 10, then I'm going to do things um, to soothe. So I'm going to encourage um, that student to do things that soothe themselves quickly. Breathing is a number one thing. Um, touching, if you're anxious and fearful, maybe touching two different textures. Um, things that help bring your heart rate down and soothe you immediately. If you're in the mid range of like four, five, or six on that scale, then I am encouraging people to do things that help them communicate or help them feel connected. So um, that might be when you text your best friend and say, today stinks, you know, um, and you just feel that sense of connection and you're communicating how you're feeling or communicating what's going on with you. The down in the lower range, when you just know that that emotion is just kind of there in the background and not letting up, um, that's when I go into making plans making plans for how can I help myself? Who do I reach out to? Who do I know that could, um, could help me? What are my resources? So. Thank you. Thanks, Rod. So um, I had some information I wanted to tell you real quick that is not actually in the slides, but I just wanted to tell you that when you have anxiety or depression as a teenager, actually as a adult or a teenager, but either way, that they can be caused by um, a lot of different things. Um, the school environment is a high pressure situation and peers, um, there's the pressure to belong to a clique, to not belong to a clique, to uh, achieve. Um, there's pressure from all sides. And sometimes people really pressure themselves, pressure themselves to be perfect all the time, which is actually not uh, something that anyone can achieve, but can cause a lot of um, distress when mistakes happen. Um, there's also the, if you have any um, difficulties with focusing, you have you know, ADHD or if you have problems seeing the board or if you have um, anything that makes you feel different from other people, then sometimes that causes a feeling of not really being like other people, which can cause feelings of anxiety, depression, or depression, I should say. And there's um, just, we talked about social anxiety. Um, and sometimes, you know, it, it can just be something environmental. And by that, I mean, something happened in your life. Uh, you lost a, a loved one, a, a, like a grandparent. Um, you broke up with a, 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 a significant other. Um, or even, um, you know, things changed within your peer group. Sometimes people are your friends turn out to not be your friends. Um, and then you feel just this loneliness, you feel sad, you feel like out of sorts sometimes. So those are kind of things to look at sometimes when you don't really know exactly why this is feeling is in you, 
you're feeling this inside you. I just want to say something real quick. Your idiosyncrasies are what make you you. <laughs> and so anytime you try and become like someone else, you're taking away who you are. And so whoever is your real friend, and we find that out in life, whoever is your real friend is going to appreciate you for what you have to offer that's different from anybody else that they've ever made. So you don't have to come and be like anyone else uh, to, to be valuable because your value is in your uniqueness. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> is it normal to not feel happy all the time? Yes. <laughs> if you're happy all the time, that's not normal. <laughs> Do we want to go in any ways? Okay. All right. So what I wanted you, that was a perfect last uh, question because it says um, emotions come in waves. We can't control what happens to us, but we can control how we respond. So emotions, you're going to be high one day, you know, up and down, and it depends on the situation. So, you know, you walk into class, you thought you had a test, you were anxious, then you find out there's no test, and now you're, ah, you're able to breathe and you're able to relax. That's like two different emotions. So we want you to know that emotions, all emotions are good because God gave us all those emotions. And so the key is to be able to regulate those emotions. So you want to be able to go from sad to the next day, you want to be able to use some, some, um, you know, some interventions or some strategies to, to help us. So emotions matter. And the first thing that we did today was I wanted you to feel your feelings. So it's okay to feel and to know, you know, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm scared, I'm worried. We have all these feelings. And sometimes if you um, there's always extremes, like we spoke about with the depression. If it lasts, you know, more than a week or it's going on to the next week, you know, it's time to reach out and get some help. But if you're just sad because, you know, you, you failed your math test <laughs> or uh, something happened, there are some things that you can do to navigate these feelings. So we're going to look at a couple of these. Um, if it's something you think you can use, take a picture and uh, save it and you can probably use it. So here are some things that you can do, because uh, remember, emotions are like waves. They come and they go, and we want to learn how to respond to them. So we start with the easy one, which is happy. And so every now and then we feel happy. Um, so you can share, um, share it with your loved ones, whatever made you happy, share it. Um, you can write it down, and then don't forget to celebrate. So whatever made you happy, remember you're unique. So whatever makes you happy may not make someone else happy. But if it does, you want to celebrate you uh, because a wave is coming, right? A different emotion is about to hit. There comes sadness. And so when you feel sad, here are some things that you can do. You can hug someone, uh, someone you love. Spend time doing something you like or talk to someone. Remember, all these emotions are going to come. So the key is for you to know ahead of time what you're going to do when that emotion comes. So if you know you're going to have negative thoughts in the day going, going forward, have your affirmation ready, write it in your book so that you can remember, you know, okay, you know, anxiety is going to come throughout the day, but I'm going to remember what I'm going to say. Uh, sadness is going to come. So have that person who you know you can uh, depend on, whether it's, it don't have to be a friend, it could be a mom um, or someone. And um, spend time doing something that you like. So you need to know ahead of time, you know, what do I like to do? Color, um, just hang out. Uh, notice we didn't show you a phone. So something besides <laughs> clicking on the phone, okay? All right. And um, here comes anger. And so when you feel angry, here are some things that you can do. Um, so a deep breath is good because you, uh, this is your frontal lobe. And when you're anxious or you're afraid, your, your frontal lobe no longer thinks you're in fight or flight mode. So taking a deep breath helps you to get energy, ex, um, oxygen to your brain, and it helps you to think better. So that's why taking a deep breath is so important when you're angry. Um, so practice taking your deep breaths. Um, you can drink some water or go for a walk. So I want to ask you quickly, what's something else you can do that works for you um, when you feel angry? So one of you in the, in the crowd, what is something that you can do? when you feel angry and you think it helps you calm down because another student might um, think it works for them. So you're right here in the glasses. 
in the black shirt. What's something that you do when you feel angry? Listen to music, so that's a good one. So he would have his music cued and ready if he's going into a situation where he think, okay, I know this person is about to annoy me. Let me have my music ready so I can do my deep breaths and listen to my, to, you know, to my favorite artist. Anyone else have something else? Yes. You do art? Nice. So she can draw. Don't break the crayon, all right? <laughs> all right, you, thank you. Okay, so she will pray, and, and that's some um, you can breathe and pray, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she's going to, <laughs> she can pray, and that's a good one. And sometimes when you want to journal, you can journal to God. That's always an option because he keeps your secrets, whatever you don't want. He's not going to tell anybody and, unless, you know, he wants them to know somehow. But <laughs> all right. And so those are some great ones. Thanks for sharing, guys, um, that you can do, and you need to know ahead of time before the feelings come, right? I see her shaking her head. She's agreeing. She has hers locked and loaded as well. All right. Uh, so what about when you feel scared? Let's think about some things um, and, have, and write them down um, and be ready. So tell your parents or your loved ones is something you can do. Uh, write down your thoughts about why you feel scared. Uh, I know I used to be afraid of dogs uh, because I got mauled twice when I was little. Uh, before five, I think I got mauled two separate times, two separate dogs. And so I was afraid of dogs. Um, and then I went through something like this and they was like, well, what can you do? And I said, you know what I can do? This was like a, uh, about maybe two years ago. I said, I can get a dog and that's going to help me get over my fear of dogs. So we got a rescue dog and um, now I'm not afraid of dogs anymore. <laughs> All right. So, um, so come up with something about, you know, if you know already you're afraid of something, you can try to have someone brainstorm with you and then you can have a way to work through that. And it can be you're afraid of a test or you're afraid of a subject, whatever it is. Um, the last one says um, do stretching and shake it off. Does that work for anyone? Oh, she said it works for her. I, know, I don't think that worked for me, but everyone has theirs. So you got to find which one works for you. So try different ones. Um, when you feel scared, and that's what you want to try to do. All right, and now there's worried. So SAT, I think SATs just passed, right? And so some of you may have, if you're in 11th grade, um, you may have been anxious or worried. So another word for worried is anxious, and we had a great explanation about what anxiety looks like. So we have to recognize how it feels. Um, so when you feel worried, take a deep breath. Here goes the breath again. Uh, believe in yourself. Um, right there is where you can also say a prayer in the mirror or you can say an affirmation. And then um, most importantly, if anything is going on for a while and you need support, be sure you reach out and you talk to someone. And that's the key thing we want you to take away today is you're not in this alone. We all have emotions and we want you to learn how to uh, we call it regulate to self-regulate. So one day you may be feeling sad. You need to regulate and be able to have yourself go from sad to at least, um, you know, anxious, which is like yellow. I wish I brought the wheel, but we have like a you know, the color wheel. So you want to just see yourself driving through or surfing through life and being able to manage how, because the wave is going to come and you have no control over, over it. Uh, but you can control how you maneuver through with your emotions so that they don't overwhelm you or you don't feel like you're drowning. So be sure that you talk with someone. And I believe that's it. So hopefully, um, at least for this part. Oh, there's one more, scared. I thought we did that already. Oh, I went back, sorry guys. <laughs> All right, so some ways may be stronger, but always remember they will all pass. So don't do something permanent for a temporary situation. It will all pass and you'll look back at it and say, wow, you know, that was a rough season of my life, but I made it through. And prevention. So when we're talking about prevention, um, we are talking about um, things that you do for yourself, um, your personal care, uh, things that, that you um, do to take care of yourself. And that usually involves um, your physical health, um, as well as your emotional health. Uh, 
And so that's written on there with the personal care. And, you know, I, I know you can read that thing about decreasing your exposure to social media, <laughs> um, you know, and, and you can handle that. Um, there's, there's a lot of the, the get outside, look up, see what the, the sky looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then with prevention, sometimes I don't think of um, typically mental health counseling in teenagers. Um, lots of times teenagers don't think of a mental health counselor as someone that helps them with preventing um, problems, but that is a use for that. So they do give you tools to help you move forward. Okay. And so I really wanted to touch base with you all about how parents can help you um, or other um, supportive adults. And one of the things that I've been working with um, since I was a youth minister about 30 years ago um, is working with an organization called the Search Institute. And the Search Institute has been doing um, research on teenagers, and they call it the 40 developmental assets. And parents can be heavily involved with this. Um, and so the research um, that's been going on now for about 60 years um, shows that more than 5 million young people have consistently shown that these assets that they have, these 40, this developmental asset list that you can get a copy of it on the QR code, um, uh, shows that when young people have these assets, when they have these things, like they have um, supportive adults in their lives, when they are engaged academically and when they're engaged in community activities, when they're doing things like the Apopka Youth Council and engaged in that, um, these are the students that are shown to do better in school, to be civically engaged, and to value diversity. Um, and they're also less likely to have problems with violence, drug use, alcohol use, and um, sexual activity. So those are usually things that we want to encourage with young people, and we want our parents and other adults, other adults in young people's lives to support. And so how do we do that? Um, and how do parents actually help support? And one of the things that parents um, can be helping to do as well as teachers and other community leaders is to show um, young people that they matter, okay? Um, and engage and actually have a conversation with them, not just how is school today? But what are some of the things that um, give you energy and excitement, things that you love? Okay, those are the sparks, okay? Um, but developmental relationships that are really healthy also challenge the growth, okay? The commissioner just walked in here and was offering um, scholarship applications to some of you. That's challenging your growth. Um, to make it so that uh, you go further than where you are right now. Um, that's a developmental relationship, a healthy one, where somebody that challenges your growth. The instructor at school that gives you a hard time about, you know, phoning in that assignment that you just did and got it turned in at 11.59, you know, um, and you knew it wasn't really very good, you know, and that's the instructor that challenges you on that. Um, healthy developmental relationships also provide support. Um, they help you with completing tasks rather than criticizing you for how you've done it. Okay. Um, they also share the power with you. Olivia is sitting up here. Okay, the power has been shared with her. <laughs> The power. <laughs> She's got the power. Um, and, and, you know, sharing power with a teenager means that you're treating them with respect. Okay. And you're giving them a say in what happens. Okay. A, a teenager might not be able to have ultimate say in what they do, but um, those developmental relationships are ones where they accept the teenager's input. 
power can start to be shared with young people, even when they're as young as like two and three years old, you know, with um, what do you want to wear to school today? You know, and, and allowing, you know, as long as you don't have to have a be, you know, okay, it's a uniform, oh, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but you can start sharing power with young people when they're actually very young. You don't have to wait until they're 13 and older. Um, these healthy developmental relationships also expand possibilities um, and make it so that um, you're inspired. You know, this video that you all put together, that's an inspirational video. You've just expanded the possibilities of others in the community and anyone who watches that video. And you just, by showing it today, expanded the reach of that video. Um, by sharing it with others that you don't even know. Okay. So that's really, really powerful. And so this interview is just a tool. So this QR code takes you to the four S's interview. And the four S's are ask a young person that you know, what are their sparks? What are the things that energize them? What are they excited about? What are their strengths? What are the things that um, help them know uh, that they're capable. Okay. And then what are their struggles? Struggles is put down as third for a reason. Because if you're engaging with a young person, you're not going to immediately go off right off the bat with something that's hard for them to talk about. But if they're feeling comfortable with you and they're talking about the things that bring them energy and the, the strengths that they have, then they're more likely to share with you their struggles. Okay. And then wrapping it up with who are their supports? What are their supports? Um, and are their supports things that they can access? Okay. So that give you that. No. Ah, okay. And so I did also want to, um, I know that others might also want to address this issue of teen suicide because that is something that is um, you know, we're experiencing within our community right now. And you all may know someone um, or know of someone or know of a friend that has lost a friend at their school. Okay. Um, and so this QR code takes you to some of the statistics um, that have been uh, collected, unfortunately, about teen suicide since 2020. Um, and one of the things that you can do as teenagers is if you hear a friend of yours that is um, indicating that they're feeling hopeless, that they don't have anything to live for, like what Courtney was talking about, don't be afraid to bring it up. Don't be afraid to say, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Um, do you want you know, are you thinking about maybe killing yourself? Don't be afraid to bring that up. Okay. Um, on our uh, table out there uh, is a cheat sheet is what we call it um, for, you know, because lots of people get anxious if they hear that somebody that they love and care about is feeling suicidal. Okay. Um, and so the cheat sheet is just this acronym is path warm. Um, and the I and the word is stands for ideation. Ideation means, do they have the idea? You know, is that their idea in their head? Are they thinking it? Um, is it an actual threat? Um, or is it just a hopeless kind of thought? The S in is um, path warm stands for substance abuse. Are they, you know, vaping um, marijuana cartridges? Are they... Um, drinking alcohol and sneaking, you know, vodka and stuff like that, you know, into their water bottles, you know, all of these things. What are they doing? You know, um, the P for in path stands for purposelessness. You know, do they have a purpose or do they feel like there's no purpose in their life? Do they have no reason for living? Okay. Um, are they dealing with anxiety? That's the A. Are they feeling trapped? Like they can't get out of this situation. There's nothing that they can do. 
Um, are they feeling hopeless? Um, that's the path part. Um, warm is, is there withdrawal? Are they giving away possessions? You know, um, are they dumping out things that um, the two of you have shared? You know, necklaces that you made together when you were at summer camp. Are they dumping all of those at your house and saying they don't need them anymore? You know, um, that's part of that withdrawal. You know, is there anger? You know, that they can't seem to regulate, like what Janice was talking about. Uh, is there some recklessness? Is there risk-taking? Okay. Um, because they don't care, especially if they're driving. You know, are you seeing risk-taking behaviors with your friends when they're behind the wheel? Okay. Um, are there mood changes? You know, um, are they sad more days than not? You know, and things like that. Definitely ask, ask the question. And you want to assess, you know, if they have, if your friend has um, the idea and they have a plan and they have the means to carry out that plan, do not leave them, but do call for help. But do not leave them, stay present with them. Okay. Um, that's my soapbox about teens. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so connecting with your teen, you know, is, is one of those things. We do have handouts and the information is on that. Another question. What is the difference between stress and anxiety? Do you want to go with that? Stress is, um, well, the body uh, is, uh, responds to stress. Stress is a change in your environment. Stress can be, as mentioned earlier, um, you know, if you're going to have a baby and you're pregnant and you, um, but you're really happy to be having a baby, you're still going to have stress because, well, there's a lot of changes in your body and there's a lot of planning. Uh, the wedding you know, planning a wedding, stressful, dealing with in-laws um, might be stressful for some people. There's um, also, there's, basically it's a change that, um, that affects you from a physiological and, and mental point of view that can be either seen as positive or negative, but it still causes um, that, that, um, that reaction. So when you are under stress, let's say you work somewhere that, you know, you work a lot of hours, you have a lot of responsibilities, boss is kind of difficult. Um, you, you may not be anxious, but you could be stressed out. And you, and you handle stress in, in ways like, like self-soothing. Um, exercise can really help with stress because it releases a lot of that, um, that uh, angst. Um, anxiety is more like, along uh, worrying uh, a lot of times it's worrying or it's fear um, and it's in response it is often in response to things that have not yet happened or may not ever happen uh, if you're thinking about the future you are worrying about things that have not come to pass and may never happen so you know what the, I call it the what ifs you know what if my house burns down? What if, you know, my, uh, you know, what if my father gets sick? What if, you know, a lot of things. And often, a lot of times there are things that have a low probability of happening, but whether it does or not, it's, it's you know, so what if, you know, um, what if your father gets sick? Uh, your father, you would probably, he would probably call the doctor, he would probably get medications, uh, you know, take care of himself. But people stop at what if and just worry in circles about why, what if this happens. So stress is uh, feeling a little bit over, feeling um, physiological uh, reaction to a lot of things going on at one time, a lot of changes that you can uh, reduce by taking care of yourself. Anxiety is more, a little bit more of a problem because um, it can impair your functioning if you have anxiety about your being in school, you might not go to school, and then it causes problems. You can't graduate. If you worry about the future too much, you might not, you know, go out of the house, or you might not do things like we said before. So, 
really the anxiety is more problematic. Um, you can get out of it by deep breathing and like you was mentioned, like the affirmations that were mentioned, you know, telling yourself that you don't need to worry about this. I don't need to be afraid of this. This is, I'm just going to do this that I want to do. Um, and if you can't do that on your own, sometimes you might need help. Thank you. It sounds like stress and anxiety are um, different, but I hear that there's a lot of it like within high school, definitely. So it's important to know that there are ways to deal with that. Olivia, at this time, I would like to um, address the audience. Um, if you have a question that you would like for us to like to come up to the podium and ask, you're more than welcome to. And we'll kind of flip back and forth. OK. Is there anyone that would like to come up and ask a question to the panel? Good evening. Good evening. So my question is that you probably heard of the word escapism used before through media and how some people use it to get away from maybe traumatic events or stressful situations in their life. Do you think escapism could be used as a positive or it could be used as a negative for degrees. stress? Degrees. Everything is degrees. Am I going to use it to get away from it for a moment or am I going to do it to not deal with it? So everything is degrees. So sometimes, hey, if that's your escape to not go down a negative pathway, then for sure take that. But we have to be careful how long we escape the thing because at some point in time, depending on what it is, we're going to have to deal with it. And so we can we don't have to deal with it ourselves, but we're going to have to deal with it. So it's degrees. Thank you. <laughs> Give her a hand. Yeah. That was brave. <laughs> oh, we just yeah. have another. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll come back to the podium. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll come back. <laughs> so another question submitted. Um, how do I cope with grief? I'm going to jump on this one as well. Um, when dealing with grief... First thing we have to understand that everybody grieves differently. And grief, I don't want to sound overly heavy, but grief is a lifelong process. Because when you lose someone you're close to that you love, you're going to have the memory of that person in your mind for the rest of your life. So it's a lifelong process. Now the acuteness isn't as severe as time goes along, usually, usually. But it, it can be kind of like almost like phantom pain because your mind remembers pain easier than your body does. And so when you think about that loss, sometimes you can go just as deep into that loss that you had years ago as when you first felt it and sometimes even worse. And that's just the truth of it. So knowing those things is, okay, how do I, how do I deal with that? When I'm feeling that way, I need to be around loved ones. I need to be around folks that, that really love me, that can pour into me, uh, whether it be positivity, whether it be prayer, whether it be, you know, just an embrace and really understanding that this is something that I'm going to, is going to come up. Um, I think a bad language for it is getting over it. I think that's a really bad thing to, a uh, wrong way to go about it. It's not about getting over it. It's about learning to live with it, learning how to manage it. I'm going to feel that loss from time to time. I've I've lost young people in my life. I've lost older people in my life. And depending on those re uh, those uh, relationships is how you're going to feel it and what time it feels around when it comes around a certain holiday, when it comes around their, when it comes around their birthday, when it comes around an anniversary that you two had together. All those things are going to bring it up. Sometimes just being in the company of other people that know them, like, I remember, remember when so-and-so used to do this, and that can take you there, too. So it's a being aware of that everybody's going to deal with it differently and learning I'm really big on learning how you learn. So learning how you deal with it. Okay, now, if I deal with it through, like the young lady said, uh, a bit of escape to escapism, okay, because I don't want to dwell on it, you know, in a long period of time. I'm not trying to be in denial, but I don't want to dwell on it overly long. So let me escape this for a little while uh, so it doesn't bring me down. So let's learning how to live with it. I can go into a couple more scenarios, but give um, the others uh spacious talk but it's learning how to really learning how to deal with that and saying okay i'm feeling this 
And don't think that, and again, I don't want to sound overly heavy, that it's going to go away. That's, that's not what's going to happen. It may not be as acute, again, but it's like, okay, I feel that this comes up when this date comes around, when this time comes around, it makes me think of this person. Grief is the cost that we pay for love. You know, it's like, I know that I, when I feel that, that just assures me that I love that person. So I can also counter my grief by knowing that, hey, I feel this way because I love them. Thank you. That was very well spoken. <laughs> <laughs> you, did you want to ask your question at the podium? So this is kind of out of what you are talking about right now. But I want to say, can the average person be a psychopath? And if so, what are some signs that someone is a psychopath? So, yeah, what are some signs that someone is a psychopath? That's tough. <laughs> um, okay, so someone being a psychopath, um, what I'm usually looking for, if I'm concerned about that, um, is I am looking for problems in their life um, that are signs that they had problems with attachment, which means that um, they didn't have someone um, in their early stages of development, um, like in birth to about age three, um, that that person did not have someone that loved and nurtured them, okay? Um, and so that is the first sign that I look for. Um, psychopath is one of the terms that's getting thrown around these days, like, back in the 1970s, somebody would have said they're crazy, okay? Um, now people say, oh, you know, he's a psychopath or she's a psychopath. Um, and it doesn't, the, the diagnostic criteria <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean the same thing that, um, that we use, I think the term is colloquially, you know, I can't say that word. Um, <laughs> but in our common everyday language. Um, but someone who truly is a psychopath um, has no sense of connection or attachment to other people. And so therefore there's no empathy um, for others. Um, and it's not accounted for um, by other uh, cognitive um, and other mental health and societal situations, okay? Um, just because somebody struggles with empathy doesn't mean that they're automatically a psychopath, okay? So that's a little bit about how I would be looking for that. Thank you. Jane, did you have a question? Hello, everyone. How are you? Um, I spoke to Dr. Jackson. It's not really a question. It's really um, my journey with mental health thus far. And just, I guess, like encouragement for anyone else who's like, you know, struggling. Because I know sometimes like it feels like almost like a disconnect sometimes when you hear advice from people that are older than you. Because it's almost like, oh, you don't understand what I'm going through right now. But like, I promise, like, we all go through things. So um, I didn't think that I'd be up here speaking today. Um, I lost my cousin a week ago to gun violence. So um, we've kind of, I've had like a week, but um, just kind of wanted, I guess, to share with everyone um, the fastest way I can possibly do so. Um, I think the best place to start is kind of where I grew up. Um, I grew from two immigrant parents that came from Haiti. I'm first generation Haitian American. And um, my parents did everything they, they, they could for me. Um, my mom would go hungry so I could have a plate to eat. Um, my dad would sleep on the floor so I could have a pillow. Um, my parents would collect change in bathrooms to, so we could have something to eat. But yet I still was embarrassed about this and I'd go to school every day and I'd lie about my situation 
And I'd tell everyone that I lived in a house that looked like it belonged to Nelly in 2001. And I had everything that I needed, but it wasn't true. Um, I kept up this persona, I guess, and I found things along the way that kind of made my fake reality kind of feel real. Um, I put myself on the title of student athlete, and I think I was the best at what I did, in my opinion. Um, I worked very hard for eight years. I had the offers. I was where I wanted to be. I had a 4.9 GPA in my freshman year. Um, I was exactly in the position, and I thought that gave me value as a person. And then um, <laughs> I tore my ACL, my PCL, my LCL, and both of my meniscuses. Um, my sophomore year, and I couldn't get out of bed, and I couldn't open the laptop when school's online, and I couldn't do anything. But, you know, I'd been lying this far, so what, what was it to keep lying, you know? Like, I was like, okay, like, I'm at home, it's easier now. Like, hey, everybody, I'm going to practice, and I'm sitting in bed. So um, that was happening, and as I kept lying about my situation, and as I kept believing that I was a strong person, things just started getting worse and worse and worse and worse because you periodically go down. It's not like a day that you just go down. It's very periodic. So um, some ways that I continue and I have gotten better was just understanding that motivation isn't something that comes from just you living. Motivation comes from motives. That's the first part of the word. But what happens when life seems like it has none? You know, that's when discipline comes in play. That's when you have to ask your friends and your family for support. That's when you make calendars. That's when you, like, try to have people to rely on and shoulders to cry on. Um, another thing was letting go of the tangible things. You're not the things that you do. I promise you're not. Um, my ninth grade year, if you asked me who Jade was, I'd probably start reciting off my resume to you. But um, it's completely different now. So... I mean, you have to understand that you're so much more than just these things that you do. Um, I understand that life, we put a lot of pressure on us being student athletes, us having good grades, but those are not the things you do. I'm proud of everyone if you have those accomplishments, but that's not you. You're so much more than that. Um, and the last thing I'd want to say is to just understand, stop category categorizing yourself with these negative words. Um, my whole life, I was told that I'm a very messy person, and I started to believe that. But you have to understand that sometimes society just doesn't have the resources for you available. So if you are messier, if you do struggle with anger, that does not mean you're an angry person. That does not mean you're a messy person. That does not mean you're a wrong person. It just means that you need a little bit more support. So just ask for the support. Um, I kind of try to describe myself sometimes as wanting to be like wind. Um, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible describes people that are born of the spirit like wind. You don't know where you're going. You don't know your destination, but you know that you're moving. Um, that's how everyone, and that's how I, I really do aspire to be. Just move. Just allow yourself to live. Your, your story is already written in a big book somewhere. It's just here for you to live. Things are not here for you to understand. It's for you to, to learn. And lastly, um, your purpose. Um, I know that there's this big, I guess, thing about purpose and all of this. And everyone wants to know their purpose. And the, the truth is, like, your purpose isn't there for you to understand either. Your purpose for today might have been to walk past somebody in a gray shirt. Like, oh, my gosh, gray reminds me of happiness. That was your purpose for that time. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have the next 50 years figured out for yourself, you know? Um, and yeah, um, oh, I'm sorry, y'all. But um, another thing is like, as teenagers, I know that we look at our phone a lot and this whole self-healing journey thing is really popular right now. And I just want you guys to let you know that um, going to brunch twice, if you go home and you don't feel better, that's, you're not crazy. It doesn't really make you feel better. Um, self-healing, it, it may, but self-healing, self learning yourself, it's going to come with a lot of tears because you're going to find those moments of yourself. You're going to find those positions. You're going to find that that side of you that you try to hide for so long. Those mistakes you've made, they're going to come back to life. So I just want you to let you guys know that like self-healing, it will hurt sometimes. 
But I promise you, after you get past that hurt and you use these resources that everyone here is kind of telling you, it's going to get better. So, um, yeah, I hope everyone has a great day and you guys can tell me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Jade. Is there anyone else that would like to say anything or have any other questions for the panel? No? All right, so we're gonna answer one more question, okay? Question, do I have bipolar disorder just because my mood changes? Unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Dr. Janice was talking about you know, our moods and our emotions come in waves. Um, and sometimes our moods um, take extreme shifts. And uh, bipolar illness is defined by extreme shifts. Um, and just because you have extreme mood changes does not mean you have bipolar illness. Again, just like a psychopath, um, Bipolar illness, um, for an official diagnosis, there's criteria that needs to be met. And it's not just being moody. And it's usually uh, genetics, usually. There are some genetics at Sometimes. play and, mm -hmm. and things that, that go into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Panel, I'm going to give you all an opportunity to say any other parting words or words of encouragement, and then we'll, we'll wrap up our night. Um, I just have a few things I just want, you know, for, you know, us to hold on to that. Uh, one of the uh, great principles that I live by is awareness is our power to make an informed decision. And so once you become aware of what your triggers are, what makes you happy, what makes you sad, that's now I'm informed to counteract whatever is happening. You see what I'm saying? So I have to, I have to know those things and recognize those things. Another thing is with all the guidance that's been given today is that um, whatever guidance that we find um, that works for us and that's good for us, we can't just let it become guidance. We have to let it become governance. And so it can't be just something I'm guided by. It has to be something that begins to rule my life because what happens with the waves that Dr. Janice was talking about is this, is that, okay, I know these waves are coming and I have something to counteract that. Now I can't just be thinking about it. I have to move that way. So when the thing, when the negativity comes, if I know somebody's negative around me, I have to start questioning my relationship with this person, even if they're family. I'm not going to stop loving them, but I need to learn. Sometimes we have to learn how to love from a distance. And so it's like, I love you, but being around you is not good for me. And it's okay to know what's not good for you. All right. And, and to speak up as well. So another thing is openness accommodates opportunities. If you're not open about what's going on with you, you're actually listening to opportunity for you to get help from the many people that are around you that are loving you. Because one thing that happened with people that um, start thinking about taking their lives, they don't they think it's going to be easier for everybody else when they're not around. So it's actually a lot of people think that suicide is selfish and it's really not. A lot of times, it's really not. I know it sounds crazy. It's really not. A person's actually thinking that think that they're thinking of other people. And I'm not. I'm not a medical professional, but they're shaking no, their head. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not. I'm not You're off. On okay. <laughs> You're on target. I, I just want to make sure that I'm in my lane. <laughs> but uh, you know, when when it's people that they think that they're taking care of other people, and so we have to make sure that those people that show us those signs and those signals, yes, speak up. And this is the one thing that I say. That's the secret you don't keep. If you know somebody's thinking about that, that is not the secret you keep. That is not the thing that you keep to yourself and you don't tell. Because you might not know how to help that person other than to love them. But you got to reach out to your counselors. You got to reach out to your teachers, somebody that can actually get this person help so that they don't follow through with that. Because the world's going to be a dimmer place without them, even though they don't see their own value, even though they think it's going to be better without them. So that's um, uh, a thing. Um, two more things and I'll be out y'all here. <laughs> but... Um, Comparison is divisive. And so anytime we start thinking about comparing myself against the next person, I'm, 
you know, I mentioned, she mentioned being a student athlete. I'm trying to compare myself with them. You have an entirely different skill set. You have an entirely different background. You have an entirely different motor. There are a lot of people who are less skilled, but have more heart. And that's what got them into the position that they are. So comparison is divisive and it's going to devalue somebody. And a lot of times it devalues us. Last thing is your competition is your yesterday. That's your competition. You're not competing against your classmates. You're not competing against society. You're competing against your yesterday. What did I do yesterday that I can do better today? If I had a bad day yesterday, I bet you I can have a better day today. I bet you I can have a better day than I had last week. I had a bad week, but I bet you this week's going to be a better week. And you start competing against what happened, what happened in your life. What can you do to better yourself? And so these are some things that I just want to kind of um, put out there that, that are hopefully um, helpful. So, so um, I'd like to say something. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that um, for the teens, um, well, really for anyone, but I know that high school and middle school are really a challenge and struggle. And even if you're not in, in those schools and, and any parts of life can be a struggle. And often it, it's just too painful. Um, it feels to you that it's just too painful what you're trying to go through and that that you can't see a way out and that the solution is is to to end your life because you don't see an end to the pain that is the reason why people consider suicide because they don't see how they can get out of pain and chronic pain physical chronic pain is 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 just pretty hard to manage too but this is a kind of pain that's even worse than that and so my message is really that while it may seem as if you can't get out of it, that you can and you will. I mean, these things are temporary. I mean, they're kind of long, but they're temporary. Middle school is, is, is a couple of years. High school is four years. And then all the life stressors after that, you can overcome the barrier. You can overcome the emotional anguish. You can reach out for help. And then you, you might someday look back on it and think, wow, I'm really glad I didn't take my life then because look what I've had, what blessings I've had since then. So that is what I want to leave you with. Thank you. And one thing that I also wanted to just make sure that we remind, you know, with there's many parents that are here today. Parents, if you are struggling, if you know that you need help, I want you to make sure that you are aware of the impact that it's having on your children. I can recall as a child, my mother went through depression and the impact that it had on me. So I'm hoping for you all, if you are dealing with issues, that you also are seeking the help. Okay. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I appreciate all of you. I'm hoping that this has blessed you all. You know, we thought that we would pack the room but everyone that was supposed to be here is here, and I thank God for that. Um, <clears throat> all of the panelists, are, they've supplied us with all types of pamphlets and information on how we can um, get in touch with them. Please stop by their tables and um, thank them for coming to visit with us tonight and volunteering their time. Please know that I, I truly appreciate all of you. I have gifts for you, so don't, don't run off before you see me. Um, but thank you all so much for coming, and I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being here. And get your picture taken outside. Make sure you guys take pictures with those balloons. Okay. <laughs> hmm.